My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. This man played in the NSL for a number of Victorian clubs and also got to represent the great Socceroos, none other than the great Gary McDowell. Gary, welcome to this conversation. Thanks, Sasha. Pleasure. So tell us, Gary, how did you fall in love with our great game? Well, where I come from, it's the only game. I uh, grew up at school, just always kicking the ball around. Grew up in an area where just loads of kids and mum used to call us for tea to try and get us in, but it took her forever because we just never stopped playing. From there, you, you go to school and, you know, you play for your school, you play for the BB, you play for your local team. So you're playing, you're playing three games every weekend mm. and life's consumed by trying to be a footballer in a, a nation where, you know, it's, it's family pride and they all, they just love it, you know, and when I, find, I signed my first contract, my dad, I, I could see it in his face, it was immense pride, yeah? Mm. And I had a, we had a family of seven, seven kids, so we all, six boys, who all played football. I was the first to get a contract, but uh, yeah, you just, you grew up in school and you, you follow the game that is just the game, the game of the nation and the game of the working class people, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you're born, born in Scotland, so... Uh, uh, is it in, in, in around Glasgow? Is that where you... Uh, yeah, you... yeah, yeah. Born in the heart of Glasgow, yeah. And um, so describe describe to me, so you, you're playing 1v1, 2v2, 5v5 on the street in school. More like 20v20. More like <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, you know, you learn, you learn how to be tough. You learn how to stand up for yourself. You, you, you learn a lot about life as well mm. in those scenarios where it's... Uh, yeah, it was just fantastic. Yeah, but we would play. We always had the ball, you know. We were never that poor. I hear people saying, "Oh, you know, we played with a, a ball we made out of paper," and you know, we always had boots. And that's the one thing. Mum and Dad made sure we, uh, you know, we were, we were a poor family. We never had much money, but we always got what we needed to compete in sport. Yeah, and, and it was football. So, yeah, but you know, we we played in the fields around the back. We used to get rid of the cows and. Set with goals up, and uh, yeah, the uh, you, you played your your adult life um, sort of at, at, towards the, the back or the center of the park. So, but where did you play as a kid? So, where did you gravitate to on the park when you played growing up as a teenager? I think uh, anyone who takes up football always wants to be a striker. I mean, I think it's when you're six, seven, eight, nine, you just want to score goals and and be the hero. And I, you know, I was no different. But uh, it was my, my first year. I played striker in, in school and for my local club and for the BB. Uh, the first, those three teams I played as a striker. Mm. You know, the, the older I got, the, I realised that my pace was never going to make it as a, a striker in the level that I was trying to reach. Mm -hmm. So I, I then get moved back into the centre midfield mm -hmm. and then centre, centre half, defender. And basically I played those two positions for my whole career. Yeah. But it uh, started mainly as a striker, yeah, and uh, to learn the, the, the reality of life. <laughs> the, uh, okay, so um, you, you're playing through, uh, you, are you playing club football, like a, a, an, at an underage level for your school or representative sides? And uh, talk to me, who, who is that for? Well, I was playing for the local team the, who were called uh, Phoenix Boys Club. Uh, I was then signed, I, I used to go down to Aston, I was at Aston Villa as a schoolboy, and I was there since I was 12, and at the age of 15, I played a game from a local club, and we played against Hamilton Ackies, who we played against their reserve team, and that night, the, the coach got my dad and said, look, we, we, want, we want to sign him. English clubs could only sign you when you left school, so... But the Scottish club could sign you on a, an S form, a schoolboy form. So my dad, that night, my dad said, what do you want to do? You know, because I, I was still going down to Aston Villa every school holidays. Mm -hmm. But something happened. We, we lost. There was a letter lost in, in, the, in the mail. And we never got the letter for that school holiday for me to go back to Villa. Mm. So I was good friends with Gordon, uh, Gordon Smith, Andy Gray, who all came from Drumchapel, where I grew up. 
So they were all at Villa at the time. Uh, and, you know, whether it's hindsight or whatever, but I, I actually signed for Hamilton that night. My dad said, look, I think you've got a better chance here of getting first-team football. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can always go to Villa if you're good enough. Mm-hmm. And they'll, you know, they'll come back. And I think you should sign here. The, the, the manager really likes you. And mm. anyway, I signed there. And I made my debut when I was 15. So I, Wow. I so played against Brecon. 15 City. years old. So you're playing first grade at 15. Yeah, I, played, I made my debut when I was 15. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So that's, and, uh, that's almost unheard of now. Yeah. Um, so congratulations. I look, I look back, Sasha, you know, and I'm not really, I'm not huge on patting myself on the back. You know, I, I loved playing and I loved what I'd done and, and I'm proud of it. But, you know, that was then and this is now and my life's, but, you know, my kids, I've got three sons who love the fact that I played for the Socceroos and, yeah. Mm. But, but making my debut at 15 was unbelievable, man. Mm. Like my yeah. whole family was there at the game and I never mm. knew I was playing. I get told to come in the team bus and I never brought my boots. My father <laughs> packed my boots. It was a secret. The manager said, don't tell him he's playing because he okay. won't sleep. And yeah. I want him. Anyway, I made my debut that, that day against Brecon City as 15-year-old. And I left I left it in Scotland when I was 24. Mm. And I'd played 245 games, man. So, mm. Mm. you know, it's a lot of football at yeah. that age. So yeah. the next year, so, you know, at 16, so I was... I lost control of what I was doing with my my, my, my club at, uh, uh, sorry, at my, my club level. And I was straight into the Hamilton Reserve team mm-hmm. as a 15, 16. Then I started playing. From 17 onwards, I was basically in the in the first team. So, oh. hmm. so to talk to me. So what, what's it like? You know, uh, you're still going to school at this time as a... Uh, a fifteen-year-old, and, yeah, and what, yeah. what? What? So, what was it like at the? You know, all all the boys would be in awe of uh, you making. Uh... Well, I was actually, I was, I was involved with a. We we'd actually a very good school team, where Danny McGrain's brother Tommy Tommy McGrain played, uh, with a guy called John McDonald who went on to play for Rangers. We had a very good okay. team, so there was no big. Every we were all getting signed up by professional clubs mm-hmm. and, and getting my first wage was five pounds so mm-hmm. I signed a contract at 15 for five pounds I played that game and we, we, we won the game I think we won 2-0 and I got 15 pound bonus so I, I got 20 pound in 1974 when I was 15 I think my dad was earning 30 quid a week at the time so wow yeah yeah you know, it was it was hilarious. My dad was looking at me going, I can't believe it. You know, you've, you've earned more this week than I have. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, and and talk to me, who were, the, who were some of the characters that, that uh, at Hamilton that sort of influenced your playing sort of idea, describe the, the type of football that was played at the time? Yeah, I've, I've, we, had a, we had a lot of managers there. That, that they don't last long if they're not successful. And it's, it's hard in a team like Hamilton because there's no money. Mm. You know, we were we were a club that transferred players rather mm. than you know buy good players. We used to get older players like a guy called John Blackley who played for Hibernian, played for Blackburn, played for Scotland. Legend of a guy, like an amazing bloke. Mm. Uh, Kenny Dalglish was okay. Kenny Dalglish was ready to sign for Hamilton, and then Celtic came in, and he was ready okay. to sign. And I knew him because I, I played for a club called Postal YM. And that was Kenny's junior team as well, okay. who were linked to Aston Villa. So uh, there was there was a lot of guys. Like there was a guy called Terry Wilson who he was the first player to get signed under the Bosnian rule in Scotland, and you know just an absolute character. He turned up to our first game. We were playing Dundee United in Dundee, and we, we were waiting for the bus. And this guy turned up. No one had met him. He signed on the Thursday, and he was playing on the Saturday. He turned up in this camel coat with the collar up and these dark sunglasses in the middle of winter and said, right, guys, my name's Terry. I'm your bookie. He was the bookie. He was like, he was taking bets on the bus for the racing that day. And I mean, I was never a gambler, but a lot of the guys were like, oh, yeah, here we go. And he was like, characters, mate, just, yeah. But there was a lot of managers. Eric Smith was my first manager, who, who was a Celtic player, and Leeds United. 
David McFarland, who was the Celtic manager as well, who won the, the Scottish Cup with Patrick Thistle, who my young brother used to play for. Uh, who else did we have there? We had Bertie Old, who just passed away. Bertie was my last manager there. And again, an absolute character. I'll tell you a quick one. We, we were playing uh, we were playing Dundee and we were 2-0 up at half-time. And we were going half, half-time and Bertie was like, guys, guys, that's brilliant. Yes, yes, keep it going, keep it going. It's great. There was nothing really tactical. It was just yeah. energy and passion. So we go out and we had a goalkeeper called Ricky Ferguson who had a stutter. Anyway, the, the first, second half starts and we get the cross come in. Ricky goes and drops it. The guys at the back post taps it in. They scored a decent second goal, so it's two all. The third goal, the guys hit it from 30 yards and it's bobbled and gone straight through Ricky, the goalkeeper's legs. Anyway, we go in at full time and we know we're going to get the riot act. So we walk in and Bertie comes in. He goes in. There's, there was loads of cupboards with the boots and the track suits and all the, all the kit. He empties the whole lot. He's throwing them on the floor. And he turns around. He's there for about 10 minutes, throwing boots everywhere, getting into hampers. And he turns around and he goes, OK, somebody please tell me, has anyone seen a goalkeeper? <laughs> <laughs> and Ricky's in the corner. Ricky goes, boss. He went, oh, there you are. Where the F have you been for the last 45 minutes? Oh, just, yeah. So just, yeah. yeah. Not a great deal of tactical knowledge, or but just passionate, and you yeah. know, played the game at a high level. Betty Old was Elizabeth Lyon. Yeah, you know, he won a European Cup. So, yeah. yeah. And 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 Hamilton, you you, you mentioned you were sort of um, w- one of those teams that you'd have to sh- struggle to win points uh, against the the stronger clubs, or where we where were you sort of situated? Oh yeah, we on always the... we always had a battle on our hands. Yeah, every year. And, it, you know, we, we, you get used to it. Every year was like, OK, we signed a few players and, you know, we'd sign... I remember we signed a couple of guys, John McQuaid, who played for Celtic. There was a big, strong affiliation with Celtic in Hamilton, as in players that used to sign, which for me wasn't a great thing because I'm a Rangers supporter, you know? So it uh-huh. was like, all <laughs> well, these Celtic people just keep coming in. and mm. But they were good guys and, you know, good friends and long lifelong friends now. So, yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, so um, you're, you're, you're 24, like you said, you've played over 200 games in the Scottish first flight for a club that, you know, every game you need to uh, scrap to win your points. Um, and you, you get, next thing, in, you, you're in uh, um, Victoria. So how, how did that come about? Why Australia? I had a, I had a friend, Terry Wilson, Okay. who I played at Hamilton with the ex Hibernian boy. He went to New Zealand for a six-month stint. And he called me when he was there. I, I was very good friends. We, we became sort of best mates, Terry and I. And he called me one Friday night, and he had a few drinks. And he said, big man, you need to come, you need to come here, mate. He said, they're treating me like a superstar. He said, I'm, I'm on the radio. I'm at the races. And, you know, I'm a celebrity, mate. He said, you should come. He said, come for six months. It'd be great. Anyway, I... I got a contract with Mount Wellington in Auckland. Yeah. All right. And they were, uh, they sent the contract across. While I was, I was, I was ready to sign it. I, I was ready to go for six months. Hamilton w- wouldn't release me. They said, no, nah, nah, we're not going to release. We'll let you go on a, on a loan, but you, you, you're not just going to go and walk out. So I had, I had to sign a, I signed a six month loan period for Mount Wellington. I was ready, ready to sign. And I got a telephone call from Melbourne. There was a guy called Gus McLeod, who yeah. is a very good friend of mine, a very good coach, who's still coaching Lang. He was coaching Lang Warren, and yeah, huge guy, and, and a great friend of mine, one of my best mates in the world. Like, I love the guy, and uh, he phoned me one day from Melbourne and said, "Gary, it's Gus. Gus left Hamilton the year I joined, so I knew him basically from Hamilton for a couple of months, but." He said, mate, what are you doing going to New Zealand? He said, what, what's the deal? What are they giving you? I said, that's like a thousand bucks sign on for you and 150 bucks a week. He went, mate, I'll get you treble that in Melbourne, mate. Mm. Bobby McLaughlin, the Scottish guy, is coaching Footscray, and Gus was playing with Footscray at the time. Mm. Mm. So he said, mate, 
I'll get you three grand, I'll get you 300 a week, mate. Well, I've gone, yeah, I'm happy to do that. So, so I, sat, I signed there for six months, mate. Told Mount Wellington sorry, and they were pretty pissed off because, you know, I was ready to go there, basically. But uh, anyway, signed with uh, Just, J-U-S-D, and flew in to Victoria, which was... Uh, I went to Shimper Reserve. I landed on the Thursday morning. Gus picked me up at the airport, and I got to training on the, the Thursday night. There was a there was quite a few bombs and Scots guys there, like Jamie Payton, mm. Kenny Taylor, mm. uh, you know, playing at playing at JUST. Dennis Bowen was a goalkeeper. We had, we had quite a few Yugoslav boys as well who were great great lads. But at the time, I just I got a bit. I, got, I was a bit surprised, mate, because. Uh, I get picked up at the airport and all these guys came with the big moustaches and the coats and cigars. And I'm going, what have I done here? This is like the mafia, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was a weird experience. Like, but I went to Shimple Reserve that night for training and, and I was ready to go home that night. So I thought, no, oh, I'm This is where we play. Because it was a paddock. Like, yeah. I thought, yeah. oh, man, what have I done? What have I done? And I spoke to Gus and he went, Gus, Gus, the standards, it's okay, mate. It's pretty good. Just you play in some nice stadiums and Schimpel's, yeah, pretty poor. But anyway, I, yeah, I stuck it up, mate. And I ended up, I loved it because the, the people were incredible. You know, they were, mm-hmm. they were great people. Bobby was the coach and uh, I think Bobby got sacked and we got uh, Chedo Cherkovic, yep. who was another great man. I, I love Chedo. But yeah, I was only there about six months, I think. I played for six months there. And I got tapped because I was going back to Scotland. My, my six months was up and I was heading back. And Hamilton sent a letter across and I was going straight back to Hamilton to go back to play with Hamilton. But Len McKendry got me in the pub one night and said, my son, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm going back. He said, no, no, I want you to sign. And they were a, they were a gun team at the time, Sasha. You know, mm. the, the players in that team were, mate, good players, mate. A lot, a lot of good players. Yeah, Kenny, Kenny, too, uh, sorry. There was, uh, Murphy. John, John, John Eisendorn was a hell of a player, mate. Oscar Crano was probably one of the best players I played with in Australia, mate. Yeah. Like, by far. And a great character. Great. I ended up, me and him played in the middle. Like, yeah. you know, I would win it and just, Get the Oscar, mate, and pff, there you go. You know, and up front you had Dougie Brown, Charlie Egan, who scored a lot of goals, mate. And you had Kenny Murphy, uh, Carl Halford, Alan Davidson was playing there at the time. You know, Bobby Russell, Ange Postecoglou, Stevie Blair, mate. Just yeah. So you, big, you've big named thing. you've named half a dozen Socceroos there. Uh, well, actually, that's what I used to go. Yeah. I used to go to training, Sasha, and go, wow, how good is this? Knowing these guys on my team every week, it was yeah, we were a good side, man, and good, uh, good coach, the best, best coach, man. Like Len was unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. So the the uh, so uh, yeah, so it's in this time that you first get uh, selected to to play uh, for Australia. So walk me through um, how how. How that sort of eventuated, you know, what when were you first included in the camp, and then how did you make your debut? I think it was uh, we we were playing, and I'll tell you exactly because it was me and Paul Wade. Me and Wade, they were we were playing for Victoria against Australia, and it was played at Middle Park, and they were travelling. The, the soccerers were getting ready to travel, and uh, I went out and just me and Wade they had we 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 good games that day. And and I was mate, I was determined to show Frank Arrow that I was better than the centre and half that he had met and passionate and I knew he was a passionate man. So I went out to portray that to him that day. And I think well I was successful because I was in the, the next squad we played was and it was the B team. Me and Wade made their debut against Czechoslovakia mm-hmm. in uh, in Adelaide. And uh, then yeah. Frank used to, yeah, I think uh, I think he liked the way I, I set about playing and, you know, he, he used to, he loved, he loved people with passion and determination and grit yeah. and, you know, that would die for him. So, 
Yeah, so it, it, it seemed like um, he really wanted to add some bite to the Australian team, right? So he wanted players that were going to give him that sort of mongrel. Um, and you're definitely one of those players who who could add that bite. Um, so the, well, um, the... The team that was Steve O'Connor and David Ratcliffe, they were the, mm. they were the in-house defenders who were very good at their, you know, what they've done. But I was determined and... and I thought I was better than them. So mm -hmm. I thought I could play a wee bit and, and I was tough and I thought I'd just a wee bit an edge on them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but no disrespect to those guys. They were they were big players for Australia, you know, yeah. and they had great careers. But, you know, as a player, I think if you... I remember I had one conversation with Alan Davidson. He said, oh, you know, some coaches, they, they don't, you know, don't, they don't help you as a player and they don't make you. I said, they were. If you need a coach to make you as a player, mate, then you're playing the wrong game, mate. Mm. Like, you know what? I'm going to get to what I'm going to get to by applying myself and, and being determined and, and proving to them that they need me in the team, mate. Mm -hmm. So that's what I always done, mate. I just I wanted to prove that, you know, I was better than the guy they had in there. Yeah. So. Yeah, you, you got to fight for your spot. I mean, at that level, you know, all 20-plus Blokes in oh. the camp are good. They're good enough. So yeah. it's it's, it's a, a question about system opinion, but you, you need to be on as well, right? So if you're not up and about, you know... But that, that's the thing, Sasha. You know, you, you, go on a, you go on a camp, which we had a lot of. We used to go, we come to Sydney and we'd been a camp for a month and people get invited in, into the camp, like as fringe players to see. And you could tell straight away, I had like no chance. They're good NSL players, but they don't have what it takes to get to that next level. And that's mongrel, mate. You know, you, you need to... Like Oscar Quino, mate, for the player that he was, mate, Oscar broke two of my teeth, mate, playing in the game one day. Okay, how, how did that occur? Okay. Mate, oh, that was me and him. I was playing for J.S. at the time. And okay. I've gone in and I've, I've, I've smashed him with a tackle and he's got up and he went, huh. Mate, next one is just boom, smash me, and I've gone good on you, mate. That's when you know, mate. He's a winner, mate. Yeah. As well as being a talented, you know, talented footballer, yeah. he's got he's got something done. Yeah, like like Cosmina's of this world, you know. Cosy, yeah, Cosy would hit you in for coughing, yeah. Mm, mm, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So I mean, at, at that uh, NSL uh, level. You know, you, you played, as you said, sort of that. Uh, I remember you playing as a, that six role, a holding role, or or in in the in the back four. Yeah. So who was the who's the the toughest opponent? You thought, okay, at the NSL level, I'm playing. You know, marking Crino today, or you were playing with him at, 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 at your time at South. Who or you're playing at the back at, later on at let's say Brunswick Juventus or Heidelberg. When you're marking somebody, who are you thinking? Okay, we're in for a tough day today because I'm marking either, you know, th this forward or that forward. Um, who are the sort of forwards that you thought? Okay, it's going to be hard. There was one very early on in my career in Australia where the creation team had Tommy Cumming and a guy called David Brogan up front. David Brogan was a nightmare to mark that mm. nightmare. He, he just held the ball up so well. Every time you near him, it was a free kick. He, mm -hmm. There was nothing. It wasn't really hard, but it was just very difficult to mark. Mm. Very difficult. Uh, and Tommy was then, so quick. I, I take it Tommy, the thing about Tommy was his, it was his pace that he, he'd just get the ball. And... Tommy used to just buzz, buzz all over the place. Yeah. And Dave, Dave would get it, hold it up, and knock it. And Tommy was just all over. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Other players were like... Uh, uh, one player that I, I thought never got the recognition that, that, you know, he scored a lot of goals, mate, and he was a bit of a mouthpiece, but I actually liked him and I got, I got him well with him. A lot of people used to say, oh, he talks too much, was Gary Ward. Gary was a good goal scorer, mate. And yeah, very good, yeah. He knew, his, he knew his way around the park. And again, a tough guy as well, mate. Me and him, he gave me, like, seven scars here, which was... <laughs> what, another elbow? Boy. That was a, that was another a elbow? I think it was... Yeah, yeah, he helped with me. But I mean, I gave it was he he, he done what he had to do, mate. Because I I gave him quite it was quite a naughty tackle that day I put in, which I I never really done before. But yeah, 
that day it was not, and he got me back, met and me and him met in the pub after and had a beer. And okay. I was trying to drink through a straw and my stitches, and, <laughs> but we were fine, mate. Like, but he was he was underrated, mate. I, you know, I, I thought he was a good player. Yeah, uh, no, very very good player. Yeah. The uh, okay, so um, walk me walk me through. So you've gone from the sort of a, a battler team in Footscray Chas to the really Melbourne's glamour side at, at South Melbourne. Um, what was the difference in terms of travel, um, you know, the, the, the off-the-park stuff? So maybe the social functions, you know, because we, we saw the quality of what Southwood just went out and bought whoever they wanted, right? Yeah. Um, where Footscray sort of was trying to be a little bit more strategic uh, who, who they bought. You know, they still had an okay team, but it's just they, they had to, you know, pick, pick and choose their pennies. I, I think the budget was a little bit smaller. Yeah. Um, but where you would have noticed that is sort of that off the park stuff. So talk to me about the difference about how, let's say, you would travel with the likes of, let's say, Footscray JUST and South Melbourne. It was pretty much pretty much the same. The, okay. the, as far as travel's concerned, you, you know, you go into state, you fly there, you go to a hotel and you do, you know, you do your thing, you've got a roommate and then you go and play the game, you come back. So there, there wasn't really much in the way of travel. It was uh, more how you get paid. Okay. Yeah, the, the salaries were like my first gig, at, my first meeting I had with Ellis was uh, with Len McHenry and the president, and like what they put on the table, like, I could never earn it in Scotland. Okay. Never. Playing for Hampton. Was, so Papa Savas, like, was Papa Savas the president there at the time? So, yes, he was. He was the, yeah, 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 okay. So you sort of. So it was Pat, uh, Sam Papa Savas. And then, God, I can't remember who the next one was. George but... Vasiliopoulos, I think it was. Uh, yeah, another... George was there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah George. okay. So George there, yeah, they, yeah. They, they really But, you know, up. just the, the facilities at Middle Park, you know, it was a good ground. The ground was immaculate. Yeah. Training was, like, I love I love training with Lenny. It yeah. was, I mean, it was very predictable and it was routine and everyone thought it was boring, but I, I just, I was like, and, you know, and a funny story because when I first signed, they, they bought me to basically take over Alan Davidson's position. So Dave went to Nottingham Forest, and Lenny was playing me wide on the right. Okay. And I'm like, and I'm just not enjoying it. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I don't have the pace to, you know, burn, get past people and burn them and, and get crosses in and stuff like that. So we've played eight games, and we've won eight games. We're sitting top of the league. We'll get more bonuses every week. And I go and chat Lenny's door on the Tuesday night. And Lenny says, yeah, yeah, come in, come in. And I've gone, he says, what is it? I've gone, mate, I'm just want to have a chat. He's going, all right, what, what do you want to chat about? I said, um, I'm, just, I'm just not happy, mate. He went, all right, all right, let me let me think about this. Hang on. Let me think, why could Gary not be happy? Oh, uh, we're top of the league. You, you're not happy with that? I said, yeah, I'm happy with that. He went, okay, well, I got rid of that one. He said, uh, number two, you don't like getting win bonus every week. I've gone, no, nah, no, nah, I like getting win bonus every week. Okay, okay, we'll get rid of that. He said, uh, you don't like my, my training? I went, no, nah, no, nah, I love your training, mate. Okay. He's gone, what the F have you got to be unhappy about? He went, this game's not about you, mate. This game's about us. He said, if you don't want to go back to foot screen, mate, and be the big hero and get beat every week, Go, man. I don't want you. He said, you've done a great job for me. You just shut up and go and play. So he taught me a lesson, man, a big lesson about, you know, get rid of the ego. And I mean, we've all, we've all got egos. And, mm. But for him, it was more get this team solid and everybody's got a key role and mm -hmm. you should know your role. And that's what I loved about the way he played. A lot of people thought it was boring and a bit robotic, but, you know, you, you're winning every week, man. And, Mm. It's it's hard to it's hard to say it's wrong, yeah. And it's all about team balance too. Like the the it you know when you're a coach, you you want to play your best players in the best possible position. Somebody's going to be unhappy with where they fit in that system. Correct. Yeah, right. Yeah. But they end so. up like you know he he knew players that he needed to sign to play in certain positions, and they end up he moved me back, and I started me and I think uh, John Eisendorn got a, an injury. 
and uh, was ready to retire. So then I slotted back in and it was mm. me and Stevie Blair and Ange and Rob, uh, Bobby Russell. That was we're back for for mm. a number of years. So, yeah. Who'd you, who'd you room with at South, like when you were... Um... Uh, good question. It's funny, I, 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 I can't even remember that, man. I remember, okay. like, uh, my soccer is was Graham Arnold and, and Alan Hunter. Yeah. Hunter for most of the time. And then when Hunter never got picked, I, I was, me and Arnie were, were roomies. Uh, yeah, for uh, for Hellas. Charlie and Dougie, they used to, no, well, mate, sorry, me and Bobby Russell, man. My, yeah. my Scottish compatriot. Yeah. 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 Me and Bobby. So um, now, I need to I need to ask the question because at the time I believe the the Socceroos were sponsored by um, a predominant uh, cigarette. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were Winfield. On yeah. So we were we were the Winfield Socceroos. Correct. And so yeah. so the story goes that um, on each camp or at each session, you know, a couple of cut, you know, the the box of cartons would come in, right, and um, you know, all the players would go and get their share, typically for a family member, right? So you'd go get your two cartons um, and then hand it off to an uncle or a brother who smoked because the vast majority of the soccer roof didn't smoke. However, word has it that you uh, use them for yourself. So tell oh. me, how many, how many cigarettes in a day would you smoke? When I was in camp, not a lot. Okay. Like in camp, because you're you're there and your roommates. What's a lot, lot, lot? Five, lot. ten? So is it five cigarettes uh, a day? Oh, probably ten. <laughs> ten. Yeah. Okay, so ten cigarettes a day in camp. But what used to what used to happen, Sasha, was the the rep from Win, Winfield would come, yeah. and he would he would come and tour with us, man, and he'd walk into the camp, and he'd have these cartons and go, guess, and he would throw them to me, and Frank Anner and Eddie Thompson would look at me going. What are, you, what are you doing, mate? I've gone like a smoke, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> ten cigarettes a ten cigarettes a. Obviously, they're free because you're getting sponsored. So in camp, ten cigarettes a day, and then on your let's say in the off season, if you're on a night out, how many cigarettes? Oh, uh, packet. I don't know. <laughs> There'd be quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> so a of few. a night out, if it, let's say you've had a big win. And you're at, and yeah, you, but that's the thing, you know. When we have a big win, there's a lot of closet smokers in that soccer room, mate. Yeah, and yeah. they all come out to play, and they're like, yeah. "Guess, guess, like, yeah." So, yeah. All right, so, so, yeah, and that, I and never really, you I never, never counted. Really tried to hide it, mate. I just, but I mean, so, but I mean, so Eddie Thompson and Frank Arrow definitely knew. So you you, you played um, twenty five times for for Australia. 16 uh, full cap socceroos at each one of those times during the week, you'd go through at least, at least a couple of decks. Yeah, man. Yeah, he's on. Yeah. Okay. And so, and, and if you'd have a win, a big win, so we, we had some really big wins. So yeah. the, the, the um, let's say if you have a really big win, how hard would the bender be? Yeah, we give it a nudge, mate. Yeah, so tell me. So, so we talk, give it talk a to me. So, talk, talk to me. Walk me through, like, if you can remember a big win, let's say for the Socceroos, out comes out without naming names. The, First the of causes. all, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people going to be watching this, mate, and, yep. and a lot of kids. So, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go into full detail, Sasha, but what we get up to, mate, because I don't think it would be very good for the game. Yeah. Because it was, it was, it was pretty a different cool. era, and th this is this, it was, it was this is my era. point. You're yeah. right. So this is my point, and and, and I, I want I want to just touch on because it's a different game. Because when when I when I was growing up as a let's say a boy at the lower leagues, I'd see senior players let's say down in the state leagues at half time dart off for a, for for a, for a fag. Um. Sorry, Matt. Yeah. So at the at the lower leagues, you know, everybody uh, let's say after the game would go to uh, the bar. Both teams would would drink at least have one right couple, and then it, it, 
you know, it, it peter off. So it was culturally acceptable. And like I said, down at the lower leagues, you know, you'd, at halftime, some, you know, one of the players would be having a, a dart at halftime, right? So now it doesn't happen. You know, there's, we're in a population where like, I think only 10% of Australians smoke now. Um, so it's dr- dramatically decreased. It's, you know, it's very expensive, etc. Well, I, I, don't, I don't smoke now either. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but you were, you were, you were a socceroo and smoking. So did you know, like, to walk me through sort of the health and fitness. Did they, did they advise you about, you know, proper sort of training regimes or looking after your body? Was there any education around what smoking did? No, nah, nothing, Matt. And so hydration we, we used, was... I mean, we used to go into camp and we were trained twice a day and, yeah, you know, it was pretty standard, Matt. There was never any, like, we, you know, you no, know, they've got dietitians, they've got, yeah, they've got guys who test your heart monitor every game and, you know, they've got video analysis, they've got, we're, we're in a completely different world, as you say. So, yeah, we, we just, we, we'd keep ourselves fit, as fit as we could. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if we were playing nowadays, we'd be a lot fitter. And I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of change. I, I don't like comparing, you know, errors because it's, they're, all, they're all different, mate. And there's different circumstances. You know, the money involved now, like, you know, we, we, we get paid 100 bucks a day, mate, to go and represent mm-hmm. Australia. Yeah, and you yeah, can never yeah. keep a job because, you know, we were, we were having to leave the country and go away for a couple of months and, you know, you can never keep a job, man. So yeah. for us, it was sacrifice, not, not, get, not making huge money. And, yeah. you know, we've still got families and we've still got mortgages and yeah. 100 bucks a day, man. And then we'd have to argue and fight. I remember we played Everton. Everton came here and we filled Olympic Park in Melbourne. They just won the English Premier League. We go and play them. And we get beaten penalties, mate, but we get no no bonus money, nothing for for playing that game. And for us, it's, it was like, man, hundred bucks we got for that game. The, yeah? uh, like, so, I mean, the uh, there, there was obviously you, you did it because you wanted to, because it was the pride of representing the country. But you know, getting paid a uh, hundred bucks to play for your country, it's not even enough to sort of sustain your family. Was there was there advocacy within the group to, to sort of try and bond together to try and make a little bit more money for the, the, the playing group? Did you try and negotiate? We, we spoke one day. We spoke one day about going to strike, Matt. Mm-hmm. Charlie Yankos was the captain. And we sat down and said, Matt, this is, this is just not good enough, Matt. The, the, they are taking advantage of the fact that they know we want to play for a country. Mm-hmm. They know we'll play for nothing. But, you know, is that, is that the right way to treat us? Because they know we're passionate about playing for Australia, so don't don't pay us any money. And we mm. were adamant that day. We were saying we're not going to play, mate. And Charlie's okay. I'll go and have a chat to them. And anyway, they resolved that a little bit. But it was never, it was never great, Sasha. You know, mm. for playing at that level, and you know, you, you should be rewarded. I think, you know, you're eleven eleven players at a total population who have been picked to wear the jersey. And and I, I, everyone, oh, you should play for nothing. That's okay as long as you've got a, a good job somewhere and getting paid, but that played with our, our role of keeping a good job as well. So, mm. you know, we're in the between the devil and the deep blue sea. So, mm. Mm. Anyway, we, we all played and yeah, we all, we all loved it. So, the uh, what, what would you, what would you say was your your proudest moment playing for the Socceroos? Which game and where you you felt like you just did a, a really nice job for them? Uh. I think it was probably against Israel when we played them in Melbourne. We beat them 2-0 in the qualifiers for the, the Korea Seoul Olympics. Mm-hmm. And my dad was there. So my dad flew in from Scotland oh, nice. to watch that game. And, and he, he went he went to most of the games when he was here. But that, that night, I, yeah, I gave the guy a bath, mate. He never got a kick. So, And he was a big guy, Pasolani, who was the guy I got banned in the next <laughs> the game. Yeah. We went to New Zealand, so yeah, but that was uh, that was a big game for us because that that sort of killed the round robin. That was us. We won every game in, in Melbourne, yeah, around Australia, and we had maximum points. New Zealand and uh, Israel had to win every game from then on in, and we felt pretty confident we could get a draw against both of them. In the end, up we got the draw against Israel and we beat New Zealand. So yeah, okay, and the um, so and and. 
talk to me. Um, what was the what was the mentality of the the, the Arok dressing room? Because he was quite innovative the way he he um, approached the game. So, what were some of the things that you remember about that 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 you know an Arok team talk? What 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 was that the essence of what he would say? It was it was, often, it was fueled by passion. He was he was. And he used to come up, like, he, I, I remember him, he'd, he'd walk up to me and punch me in the chest, physically punch me, you know, and go, you ready, boy? And I've gone, I'm always ready. I'm ready. He's like, you kill, you kill. So he, he, he actually, he poured fuel into me. I, I, mm. I, I, that's the last thing I needed. Like, because I already mm. had that in abundance. Mm. I never needed to be poured more. Like, I was mm. running out there going, like, well, here we go. Like, yeah. it was more like, like Bannockburn than, than a game of football, yeah? yeah. So, but yeah, he certainly, and it was funny to watch the different characters because obviously, you know, there's a lot of a lot of other guys in the team who don't have the same aggression as me. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're more mellow and they play it differently, but it was it was good. He even got them, he even got them a bit passionate, yeah? So mm-hmm. that was, uh, and Eddie, Eddie was a good cohort for him. You know, whatever it, Frank missed, Eddie would pick up on and, you know, and Eddie knew everyone like intimately in Sydney, okay. especially boys like you know Frank Farina and guys like that. Where Frank coached them for years, and you know he knew how to get the best out of these guys. So, yeah, but Frank was just so passionate and very loyal. You know, and yeah, again, not a great deal tactically. Okay, as far as setting teams up, and you know, I'm a big believer in at that level. You're picked for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as you go on the park, you know your job when you're in a, a system. And we knew the system. So I knew mm-hmm. my role in that system. And it was up to, was up to me to perform that role. Not Frank. You know, Frank's on the mm-hmm. sideline. As soon as I've crossed the white line, it's, uh, it's down to me and the rest of the guys. So, okay. Eddie, Eddie so, would tweak it. Okay. The... Um... And so, uh, out of the out of the two, uh, so it's you and um, Alan Hunter rooming. And when Alan wasn't in the the camp, it was you and Graham Arnold. So yeah. who was so who who let you who who let you sleep more? Army, hundred <laughs> percent. Have you ever heard Hunter talking? <laughs> mate. Non-stop, man. I remember. Uh, <laughs> I get injured against New Zealand and Alex Tobin had just been introduced to the squad. So I get, I get injured and I'm missing the next game. So Alan Hunter is in the room and he's polishing his boots and he's, I'm going, what are you doing that? He's going, oh, I'm just getting the boots ready. I've gone, man, Alex Tobin's playing that. You're, you're not even playing. Like, So Alan got the shits a lot with, with Frank because he never really got much of a run. You know, he played in games that We'd already qualified and stuff like that, but uh, but big Tob- Alex Tobin took over the mantle on that next game, and and then he eventually took over eventually when I when I gave it away, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, Alan was he's hilarious, mate. He's you know very very funny guy, mate. And uh, again, we, we went one we were in Korea training one morning, and it was like 30, 38 degrees, mate. And we used to get Coke Zero. Or coke put in the fridge mm-hmm. for after training. So we got there, mate, and you're, you're so dehydrated. I go in the fridge, and I stayed back, done a wee bit extra, get back to my room. Every bottle of coke is gone, mate, empty, lying on the floor. And I look, and I go, mate. And he looks at me, he goes, I said, mate, what are you doing? He goes, hey, when Big Al's thirsty, Big Al drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you selfish bastard. Like, uh, the, um, yeah. you know, we, in celebrations and stuff, like, having a beer with him. Like, he's, he's one of my best mates in the, in the world as well. So, you know, we've had many a night where we've probably drank too much and spoke too much. But, yeah, good good luck, Matt. Great luck. Oh, fantastic. So the... Um... So you also in your NSL career you 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 play for another two two clubs both in Melbourne. Um, so you moved from South to Brunswick. Um, so how did that transfer come about? Yeah, 
Well, Lenny, Lenny moved across to Brunswick Juventus. Lenny got sacked and we got, uh, was it, I think it was John Margaritas came in first mm-hmm. and he got sacked. And then we got Brian Garvey, mm-hmm. who I never, I never saw it yeah, with Brian Garvey. Uh, Brian was a junior coach in England and very, yeah, that, I just didn't like the way he operated and I just told him I was wanting to transfer. So, and part of that was Lenny going across to Brunswick. I, I wanted to go with Lenny because mm-hmm. I, I thought he'll turn that around. And anyway, me and Charlie Egan left mm-hmm. and I went to Brunswick, uh, which was it was good. Yeah, I was only, I was there for a year and we had, we had a very good team as well with guys like Sean Lane, Richard Miranda, Peter Lewis, uh, Charlie Egan was there. Andrew Zimi, mm-hmm. Mike Peterson, Matt, again, a mm. lot of Socceroos in there, but we just, we never fired, Matt. We mm. we just never fired, and and I was I was I was playing defence there. John Eisendorn was was his assistant. Anyway, Lenny got sacked. Brian Brown took over. Brian Brown and John Eisendorn, mm-hmm. and they got sacked, and Manfred Schaefer came and took over. Oh wow! So you had three coaches in a yeah, twelve month period. Yeah. So Manfred came in and Manfred was like, he drilled everyone. It was just like, it was like being in the army, mate. Just run, 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 run. Which I don't know if we needed that or what we needed, but we never got out of the hole, mate. We got relegated. Mm -hmm. And that was for me dangerous because I was just still playing the soccer rules. And and I spoke to Frank and he said, mate, you need to get another club. You need to be playing in this out. You you cannot play for the soccer rules in Victoria Division 1. So mm-hmm. I said, yep, fair enough. Then Jim Tanzi, who was coach at Heidelberg at the time, mm-hmm. Jimmy called me and said, well, I want you to come to Heidelberg. And I went there. And Jimmy got sacked. And Gary Cole took over. Mm-hmm. So I played there. Uh, but then, no, no, sorry, sorry. Before Gary Cole, Lynn McHenry got the job. Okay. And that, that's when I went to Heidelberg. I went to Lenny again. And played there with Lenny, and again, we got we got relegated that that year as well, Matt, which was disastrous. But we we came back up the, the the straight next year, and that was a great season. We played and we won just about every game in the Victorian League. Then we mm-hmm. played in the playoffs, and a good friend of mine. Now I never knew him in Scotland, but a guy called Al- Albie Kid. Albie was coaching Adelaide, and Albie's a cocky, you know, cocky, and he was like, they beat us one 0 in Victoria, met when we, we we hammered them, and they scored this goal. We anyway, they beat us one 0 We went to Adelaide, and he was like, "Oh yeah, yeah." Mate, we beat them. We beat them five 0 Matt. Oh wow! And it was awesome. But then we played Brisbane. We had to beat the the, the the summary was we had to get a point in Brisbane to go back into the National League, mm-hmm. and we were uh, we were two 0 down with seven minutes to play at Perry Park, and. Stuart Stevens, I'll never forget, Stuart Stevenson was up front. Ange Gutsoulis. Again, we, we had a decent side there as well, mate. But anyway, I've, I've gone up front, mate. And Jeff Olver's launch one. We get a corner, and I've scored from the corner. So we're, we're 2-1 with two minutes to play. Jeff Olver's got another. Jeff's launched it. I've got a flick on. Gutsoulis has ran on. The goalkeeper's parried it. It's rolled across the line. Stuart Stevenson's at the back post, and he, he's gone like that. And tapped it in, two all. We're back in the national league, mate. Unbelievable. That was one of the best nights of football I've ever experienced in my life. So, you, you, seven minutes to go, you no good. Seven minutes later, We're gone. yeah, you're 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 celebrating. That would have been yeah. a big night. That that celebration. Oh, mate. Yeah, we went straight to the airport from the nightclub, mate. Okay. <laughs> Bring the bags, yeah. bring the bags. We're at the airport. Yeah, yeah fantastic. When he was loved it, when he was like, oh man, it was it was incredible. It was just such a great feeling to to get up for for people that you want to succeed for mm. and you want to do well for. Well, Lenny was one of them for me. You know, I'd, I always want I get same with Frank and Eddie. They were guys that I, I really, really wanted to do well for. Mm. And then there was coaches that Oh, you know, it was a bit more, I was doing it for myself, which I don't think you get the best out of people with that sort of attitude. So, mm, mm, yeah. Mm. And there was a lot, there was a few coaches like that who coached me and I didn't really respect them. 
mm. the way they done their business, the way they spoke to people, and mm. you know the way they treated people. I just I don't like it, mate. So and I let them know I was pretty forthright in how I spoke to people. So I would mm. tell them, sorry, but I still like it, mate. So. Mm, 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 mm. so tell us, Gary. So you you played. You played uh, professionally in, in Scotland, obviously, and you played here at the, the highest level, got to represent our um, our national team. Now you're speaking to the, to the likes of that, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old boy or girl. And they've, they've, they've got something and they want to transition to, you know, first team football, regardless of whatever level it is, right? So whether it's um, state league team or a, NPL level or, or they're trying to play pro what advice do you have for them um, to transition to senior football I always look at where, where it starts and where it finishes so, so it starts with everyone the same we don't get paid we're, we're playing because we're in school and we love it so it's a passion where we, we just want to put, put a pair of boots on get a ball and go and play the game, the, the game that we love. So, you know, that, that transitions to when you're getting a bit older and you, you get to that 14, 15 where scouts are starting to look at you and they're thinking there's potential there. And, you know, I think a lot of people, and I've seen it, I've seen millions of people and I've seen the disappointment in their face when they don't get picked for a squad team. And, you know, we used to love up for like, Glasgow schools and well, I played in Glasgow schools with guys like Roy Aitken, like Murdo McLeod, mate, guys who have played for Scotland and you know that that was our Glasgow select team, which I was fortunate enough to to get picked for it. and and you see the people who are dis the disappointed people and I think the 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 beauty of it is you, you cannot stop enjoying the game as soon as you stop enjoying put your boots on and go to training and it becomes a chore and you're and you're trying to impress people, and I think you lose it then because mm. you, you know you're, you're trying too hard. And and you know when you try too hard, and you you've played, you've watched people who try too hard, they end up they make a cock of it. Mate. It just it goes pear shit. Mm. Whereas you focus on what you're good at, and and that's where I think a lot of the game now. And I'm, I'm not going to really talk about it because I don't I don't play now and, and I don't coach now. Uh, but my philosophy was always. You know, stick to what you're good at. Like centre halves are playing as a centre half for a reason, mm. and the reason is they're not good enough to play in the centre midfield or up front or wide. Mm. Mm. There, there is, you know, so why would you try and get them to play in your own 18 yard box or this football? Like danger, danger. You know, I've, I watched the game this morning. I got up early this morning to watch Rangers play, and I'm watching the centre halves play some treacherous stuff and, and almost giving goals away and so I'm, I'm a big believer in just, you know stick to what you do that mm -hmm. and and be passionate you know as soon mm -hmm. as you lose the passion find something else okay and do it for yourself do it for yourself like mm. set yourself goals realistic goals and you know talk to your coaches and ask them ask them questions what I've done right what I've done wrong like mm -hmm. it's the only way you're going to learn you know, your dad should tell you that as well, but mm. yeah, my dad was very good at that. My dad was always like, you know, hypercritical to the fact where I end up going, is there anything good about the way I play this game? And he was very critical, but it sort of helped me, mate. But some days I would love to have just him say, hey, and he did that. When he came to Australia, he said, mate, I'm, I'm so proud of you. Like, you've made a national team, which... Not everyone does like so. It was good, yeah. You know? Yeah, I think it's good. To, it's good to praise people as well, and that, that helps them on the journey. You just cannot keep destroying them and telling them what yeah. they're doing wrong, 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 wrong. So yeah, and even in my business now, it's like you know I've got bosses who are the soccer mad, mate, football mad, and they talk to me and they say, oh, you know, it's passion, it's passion in business as well. So mm. and that's life. Fantastic words of wisdom, Gary McDowell. Thank you so much for your contribution to Australian football. And uh, you've told one or two great stories today. So we wish you all the very best.
Thank you, Sasha. All the best, man. Cheers. Hey, guys. We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button and have a fantastic day.